Hello and welcome to Showcase. Today, audiobooks, a blind director, and Dali in Moscow. If he should be so far stimulated by your genius as to learn to draw himself... We explore why Americans spent a billion dollars on audiobooks. They make up one in seven people in the world. And when... Oftentimes this YouTuber when you is legally blind, but that's not stopping him from making a difference in front of the camera. And we find out why Salvador Dali's wife deserves to be known for being more than just Salvador Dali's wife. Americans borrowed about 20% more audiobooks from libraries last year. That's according to Forbes, which recently reported that audiobook sales in the United States reached nearly a billion dollars in 2018. And it left us wondering if there is more to this than convenience and clever marketing. With this, number 28 retired after a glance between him and Uriah. In 2018, the audiobook giant Audible, an Amazon company, worked with University College London on a research to see the effects of a story read to you compared to watching it on a screen. Over a hundred participants, aged between 18 and 55, watched a scene from book adaptations such as A Game of Thrones, The Girl Under Train and Pride and Prejudice. Then they listened to the same scenes on an audiobook. There was little difference in the scripts of the audio and video adaptations. But the heart rate, body temperature and electrodermal activity of the participants rose much higher when they listened to the audiobook versions. Dr. Joseph Delvin, head of experimental psychology at University College London, says the stories were more cognitively and emotionally engaging in their audio formats. The statistical evidence was very strong and consistent across all the different stories, with audiobooks producing a stronger emotional and physiological response than visual storytelling mediums. This is a result, the researchers believe, of semantic ambiguity. In other words, when we listen to a story, we're actively imagining each instance and character in our minds, whereas watching something is quite a passive action. And what we feel is basically in the control of the director. There's not much left for us to do. Mixed with all of this is some clever marketing strategies, such as making an actor read the audiobook of their latest movie. And the results? Audiobooks are booming. It happened on a Sunday. That and try simultaneously doing your laundry and reading Harry Potter. The audiobook companies say that they're all about exploring new ways of telling stories and enriching the reading experience in different formats. Oh, if he should be so far stimulated by your genius as to learn to draw himself, how delightful that would be. Alison Beverstock joins me now. She is a professor of publishing at Kingston University. Hi, Alison. Thanks so much for joining us. So, Hello, hi. Audiobooks hi. are on the rise. Okay, we know this for a fact. Ebooks are on the rise and print books are not falling down. So what does this all mean? It, does this mean that we're reading more? I think it means that we're reading more, yes. I think that different formats are sparking people to engage with books in new ways and to use more of their time to, to read or to listen. And that's having an impact on how many we buy. Okay, so for example, for audiobooks, uh, do you think audiobooks are pulling in new audiences that are not usually reading print books? Or how does this work? Do you know, do you have any statistics? I think there's some evidence that yes, audiobooks are pulling in new audiences. And I think the reason is that it's the, um, the change from seeing an audiobook as a sort of alternative format. So audiobooks used to be recommended largely for children who couldn't read or for um, elderly adults who, who'd lost, whose sight wasn't good, or for the completely unsighted. And I think now we're seeing them as an alternative, uh, uh, a different format. And that's pulling in people who use podcasts, who use downloads, and who engage with spoken word, who don't necessarily buy books. And certainly the profile of people who are buying them is looks to be uh, a lot of men and a lot of um, younger men who are not traditionally the, the most heavy buyers of books. So I think it is different markets. 
Okay, so um, the medium isn't really new. Of course, the rise is. But then can you no. please take me through the history of audiobooks and how um, it became to be a billion dollar industry all around the world? Well, of course, it's not new because actually um, being told stories is goes back right to sort of living in caves. Um, so it's one of the oldest mediums in the world. And I mean, authors like Dickens used to do reading tours where people would buy a ticket and go along and listen to him read. Um, but as I say, I think it became audiobooks became conflated with special needs reading. So for the elderly or the very young or um, for those without sight at all. And um, what I think what happened that, that changed the situation was the availability of formats which allowed um, access to to spoken word, access to, to, to reading to books um, in spoken format, uh, which enabled people to do it in their own time. So the arrival of the MP3 player, the iPod, the availability of digital downloads, and now of uh, speaker um, speakers where you can have uh, information or, or reading read to you at the time of your choosing and also the material that you want. I think that's what's really changed um, audiobooks. Okay, but how, how much do you think the clever marketing strategies contributed to the rise of audiobooks? Well, it's certainly, um, I, I'm not sure it's clever marketing strategies or just letting people know that this is a format that, that others are using. And I think a lot of it has relied on word of mouth. Um, obviously, th there have been um, strategies. So, so things like the um, Stephen Fry, the actor, in 1999 spent the whole of Boxing Day, which is for us the day after Christmas Day, reading uh, Radio 4, which is a, a mainstream broadcasting channel, broadcast the first Harry Potter book with him reading it all day. And it was vastly more successful than people had anticipated. Also the rise of the podcast, where people can download um, information uh, to listen to, that, that's impacted significantly uh, as well. Or take uh, famous actors uh, reading the books of their uh, latest movies, for example. I think, I mean, I don't know, I'm just asking you, do you think that contributed a lot as well? I, I think it has. I, I think the, the quality of the audiobook's production has significantly contributed to their popularity. So it's, it's actually um, a different experience to, to reading because you, it's often slower than you would read um, if you were reading with your eyes. And also you're getting a whole different experience because you've got an actor who's been chosen for that particular book or sometimes you've got the author themselves reading. And that can become a very um, important shared activity, mm -hmm. which um, becomes something that, that people really value. Um, uh, just to quote the example of our uh, family, we, it became a habit when we were going on holiday to stop at the channel ports and to buy an audio book, which we'd all contribute to the decision over what we listened to. And that became a shared activity in the car, which was really very special. So being read to is, is relaxing and pleasant. And that's probably why parents tend to read to their children before they go to bed because it's a pleasant way to end the day and it relaxes them and calms them and adults can benefit from that too. Okay, so let's get to the bottom of this though. You said something interesting, reading with your eyes. So I assume that you can also yeah. read with your ears. So uh, do, you, do you count uh, audiobooks as reading then? Personally, I do. I think, I think if you listen to words, um, you are reading in a sense. There's quite a lot of evidence that um, actually listening accesses the same area of the brain as reading does. Um, and uh, there's an author in the UK called Michael Morpurgo who speculated that actually when you're listening, more of your imagination is engaged than when you're, say, watching a television program where the special effects are and the visualization is done for you. So um, he would argue that it engages your imagination and involves you. There's also evidence that um, listening is, is engaging um, more of your senses, perhaps, as, as well. So mm -hmm. it's a different form of, of reading. I, I see it just as valid as, as reading with your eyes. But Alison, don't you think that people miss a lot when they're um, listening audiobooks as they're, I don't know, commuting or like doing laundry or something? Well, reading is something like listening to the radio that you can do if you're listening while you're doing other things at the same time. And actually, I think what audiobooks are doing is creating new spaces for people to absorb books. So you see people on crowded commuter trains with their headphones in 
um, or in you know where they can't possibly get reading material out to look at, or when they're driving, they're listening to to audio books. So um, actually, I think audiobooks are allowing us to fill in these spaces with access to books, which is actually creating more opportunities to read, not fewer. Okay, well, unfortunately, we'll have to leave it there. Alison Beverstock, good to have you on our show today. Thank you. Gala Dali. Wikipedia says she is the Russian wife of poet Paul Elora and later artist Salvador Dali. And that's the bulk of the entry. But she was more than just a partner of two famous men. And you can see that in a retrospective of Dali's surrealist work happening right now in Moscow. She's appeared hundreds of times in Salvador Dali's artworks, yet she is one of the most mysterious faces in the art world. Elena Ivanovna Diakonovna, also known as Gala, was born in 1894 in Kazan, Russia. She was well-educated and became a private tutor and a primary school teacher. In her early years, Gala was diagnosed with tuberculosis and was sent to a Swiss sanatorium. She met the French poet Paul Éluard there, who she later married. The relationship would not last long, and in 1929, Gala met Salvador Dali. The artist wasn't famous yet, but Gala was a presence all the way through Dali's artistic career. She modeled for him, was an acting agent, writer, and artistic partner. The 180 works that are part of Salvador Dali, Magic Art, showcase a selection entirely devoted to Gala. We're not sure if she ever actually picked up a paintbrush, but it seems that Gala's influence was so great, several pieces are signed Gala Salvador Dali. The exhibition runs until March 25th at the Moscow Menage. GIFs, memes, and emojis are some of the buzzwords the internet has brought to our lives. But it goes further than that. The internet has transformed not just the way we communicate, but who has a say about what we say. In Philip Sargent's book, The Emoji Revolution, the applied linguist argues that these colorful little symbols give tech companies the ability to control what we say to each other. And he asks if emojis are a sign that we're handing over the future of human interaction to machines. Well, Philip Sargent is here with me. Good to have you on our show today. Thank you so much. So here comes the million dollar question. Are we actually giving the tech companies the ability to control uh, what we say to each other? And where does this question come from? I mean, is it because we have to choose between the feelings that they choose for us? Is this something like that? Um, I think it's a little bit like that, yes. Uh, in terms of uh, internet communication has changed the way we uh, interact with each other so much. And yet, as we know, the big companies, Facebook, Google and so forth, they own the platforms and they own things like, well, they own the, uh, they, they control the emojis we use. And so we have a limited control of the, sort, the actual things we're now able to, um, the resources we're using, I suppose. It's not, it's not too bleak at the moment. <laughs> I mean, emojis are just, you know, symbols to usually um, express your emotions. But at the same time, um, there are only a certain set number of them. We have no control over people them, ourselves. We have no control over um, which ones we get to use and so forth. So again, it's another way in which sort of uh, big tech companies are playing a larger and larger part in, in our lives, I think. Okay, I want to get into that later. Uh, but I, first of all, let's just clear this out for me. Shall I see emojis as a separate language? I mean, or is it, is it just um, no, extra yeah. pointers to our intention as we're speaking or as we're writing? Yeah, I, I don't think you can see them as an extra language because they, they don't replace uh, the languages, the, the, uh, the spoken languages or the written languages we use. They add to them and they're not a language in their own right. You can't do an awful lot of things with them. You can only, there's no grammar to them and so forth. And as I say, there's only a limited number of them. So they're not really an extra, an extra language. They're an addition. Um, and most of the time people use them alongside lang other language. Um, and what they're best at doing, as I say, is expressing emotions. 
uh, expressing, um, giving a sort of emotional quality to what you're writing already. So adding a smile at the end of it, a frown at the end of it, making it look sarcastic and so mm -hmm. forth. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're very much, as I say, very much an addition. Yeah. And very helpful and important addition, right? Yeah, I mean, the, the most important thing about them is that these days, so many people chat, well, when we use social media, we sort of chat, but write. So we're writing to each other, but in a chatty, casual way. Mm. And when you're speaking to someone face to face, you can see them, you can see their expressions on their face, you can see if they're in a good mood, in a bad mood, whether they're smiling, um, if they're speaking loud or quietly and so forth. Of course, when you're writing, all that gets, gets uh, stripped away. Um, and, and with emojis. Emo uh, emojis, you can mm. put some of it back. And that, I think yep. that's why they're so, that's why they've been so popular. They also do other things, but those are the, those are the sort of, that's the main, the main driver behind them. And those are also the, the, the emojis that people use the most are the smiley faces, yeah. the hearts, things like that. Okay, Philip, forgive me being a, a bit blunt here, but I, I didn't really see any emojis in your book, for example. So that... Uh, left me wondering where, when are we going to see emojis in academic language or more serious texts? Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting question. <laughs> one, of the, one of the odd things about emojis, I mean, they're a digital, they're sort of born on, on digital media um, and they get swapped on, um, as I say, on social media, um, smartphones and so forth. Um, and because of that, they don't migrate very easily into written work and so forth. Um, in fact, copyright issues around using them in a book are very complicated. Whereas, you know, if I'm just sending a, a text message to you, there's no copyright issues. So that's 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 one of the odd things about them. Um, I don't think they're going to. I mean, I mean, people use them in work emails more and more these days. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't. Yes, I mean, and in newspaper articles, occasionally there have been occasional. There was a famous headline um, a couple of years ago in the New York Times where someone used. Uh, uh, an emoji, but I don't think they'll spread to, uh, yeah, academic publishing, yeah. really. There's a novel coming out next year, oh, I think it's coming out this year in France, which the title is just an emoji, and he uses emojis in the book. But it's a li that's okay. a little bit of a, you know, a bit of a novelty thing. Okay, Philip Sargent, good to have you on our show today. Thank you so much. <laughs>
need to want to be independent and, and find accessibility in, in adult life. So uh, that's a big topic in community that I've really kind of learned a lot about and even got, gotten involved with. So when I, I guess, look for things such as, uh, I try to be conscious about how would someone interact with this with any other site or, or um, sense in a way. So like how would a deaf person make music or uh, how does a blind person make visual mediums, right? I, I really try to think of all angles of how humans react and, and interact with the world around them uh, and create especially. So a lot of the stories that I, whether it be telling a real story or even writing a fictional story, um, a lot of it does come from real authentic inspiration in the world and um, I, I just, I find um, telling real stories is I think the most authentic but most human way possible. And there is this, I think, one common thread in your work that whatever you do, there's like a socially conscious, you know, thread to it. As an artist, why is this one topic important for you? It, during the process, I'm always learning. I'm always uh, figuring out new things and, and learning from the people who I'm collaborating with or featuring in the documentaries or uh, people who are consulting on my written works. and. It's become a huge part for me because I, growing up with a lack of accessibility in my education and um, even living in like a very remote uh, town, now that I live in Los Angeles, California, uh, I'm able to just get around a lot more easily, um, a lot more accessibly, and uh, having access to um, even something like movies and cinema, I never even knew that audio descriptions, which are a track of narration that describes what is happening in between dialogue, um, I always try to be aware of these kinds of things, like how would a blind person watch a film? Well, that's, you know, I didn't know this as a kid and I didn't have access to it, so I really missed out as a filmmaker, missed out on a lot of films growing up. Uh, and now I'm going back and re-watching, re-learning all these films that uh, I've just really missed out on. So it really just comes back to the things that I create is um, how can I spread awareness of accessibility? How can I spread awareness of uh, how people are just doing incredible things or, or uh, consuming such media, right? So it's, it really just comes down to how can people have access and, and bring awareness to that. Could you please talk a little bit about the reason for, uh, for the reason why you're here, the project you're working here in Istanbul? Yeah, so um, we're here with uh, Turkcell and um, there's an app that they've kind of developed and, and collaborated with which will provide audio descriptions for um, people who are blind or low vision or would, would want to cognitively be able to follow a film with descriptions. And it's really cool because back in the theaters back at home we have like a radio system oftentimes and there's a lack of awareness too even with the employees not being fully trained on how these work. I, I, Oftentimes we'll talk to employees and be like, hey, I'm, bl I'm blind, uh, I would like to have audio descriptions for the film, I just spent a ton of money to go watch. And they end up giving me like enhanced audio, which is for people who are hard of hearing, for example, who need the audio more amplified with headphones. Um, and I'm just sitting there with like no descriptions. or, or and it, So it's m very much amazing that anyone here with this app will be able to go to the cinema, see a film, and independently be able to operate it without having, you know, to work with another third party, essentially. Uh, so it really creates a lot of independence and a lot of ease of access for people who otherwise couldn't enjoy cinema. And who knows what that will do, because you know, just being able to enjoy films uh, may open up a door or an interest in, for someone who's young, uh, who's blind or visually impaired, and want to maybe make a film someday. As a director, what kind of advice would you give to those potentially creative people who think they have some restrictions working against them? Yeah, so speak up. Uh, that's, that's a big thing is um, I, I, whether I'm consulting on a project or directing it, I, I make sure that there are authentic opportunities for people with disabilities because they make up one in seven people in the world. And when, oftentimes when you don't have people who maybe the story is about necessarily, like if the story is centered around the topic of disability or a character with a disability, it's very important that we have someone in the writing room or someone who's consulting or even um, behind the scenes or even playing that character, um, authentically giving the best presentation of what that looks like. Um, not only to give an opportunity to a community that oftentimes is overlooked and, and not um, given job opportunities, but uh, also to have the best possible performance because if if a community can't even give you the thumbs up on a performance just because you wanted to use that disability as a story, 
uh, it's, it's probably not a good look um, in the long run. So I, I make sure that any project that I work on or um, uh, consult on, I make sure that everyone is as conscious and aware of that as possible. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you so much for taking your time. Thank you for having me. appreciate it. That's it on this episode of Showcase. Our YouTube channel has so much more from the world of culture and the arts. I'm Mirfere Ketti. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.